Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and today we are in Stowe, Pennsylvania, in the organ shop of Patrick J. Murphy & Associates. This is Pat Murphy. He is the owner, organ builder, proprietor of this company. Uh, Pat, how long have you been here in Stowe in this company? Uh, we've been at this location since uh, 1989. I've been in business since 1987. But I've been at this shop since 89, and we've expanded over the years. And uh, tell us a little bit about your history. Where did you learn organ building, and how did you get into the trade? Um, I, uh, after receiving a performance degree, I went to work for various companies in uh, New England and uh, Lancaster County and uh, struck out on my own in 87 following a, uh, a fire at a church where I had been doing some work which I was not responsible for and uh, we had, were commissioned then to restore the instrument which is now still serving today. We have seen one of your instruments recently, just a couple of weeks ago, visited St. Mary's Cathedral Road uh, and saw that instrument. If you didn't see that video, there's a link up here uh, where you can go watch it. Um, you not only build new instruments, but you restore old ones as well. Uh, like this one right here, tell us about this one. Yes, this is uh, E.M. Skinner 738 looking for a home. Uh, we rescued it from a church that didn't want it anymore. It's uh, seven ranks and it is a fine little instrument. Um, it is set up in our shop here at the erecting room. And uh, if you need more information, just contact us. Great, let's go, uh, let's take a look around the shop. Okay. Let's see a little bit of it. All right. So when we start a project, the first thing, of course, is that it comes, of course, is a specification has been produced. The specification, of course, has to be able to fit, physically fit, the needs of the church and the available space of the client. That's real important. That's my job to come up with that. When the specification is produced, then we come up with scaling, and the scaling then produces, which is the diameter of the pipes themselves. Once we have all the diameter of the pipes themselves, then I can send everything to the engineering department and the whole organ is basically designed on paper before we start anything. So what we have here is essentially uh, all or many of the job, many of the drawings of a specific job. Not all of the working drawings, but all of the primary principal drawings we have of a specific job. In this case, we're going to look at um, uh, Grace Lutheran Church in Astoria, New York, uh, which shows the plan view, the elevated view, and also details of the casework. And um, this was a very challenging project with a very limited space. And we had to produce um, uh, about 14 ranks to fit into a very small attic uh, location and produce uh, casework for this instrument. So all of these drawings have dimensions for everything, for the casework, uh, plan views, and whatnot. So we know where it's all going to go, how it's all going to fit, and that it is going to fit and all the casework uh, views for the uh, wood shop. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. These are schmer plates. We build our own winding systems and schmer plates in-house. So that has to be all calculated out, all the winding requirements. Here we have basically is what's called a chest layout. And this essentially is we take the scales of the pipes, we lay them out on the wind chest. We saw earlier a chest grid mocked up. Uh, once a chest grid is built, we build the tow boards, then we build we take this drawing and we print it out full size, one to one scale. We take the layout uh, template and lay it on top of the, um, of the board and if we're going to drill the tow boards by hand, we'll take the template and uh, punch out all the center spots. Mm -hmm. If we're going to drill the tow board by CNC router, which we're going to see, uh, that's a whole different story. It's all done on computer and it's merely a matter of transferring that to the CNC router computer, which center spots all the holes and drills the tow boards accordingly. And it's not just the layout of the pipes here, you even draw the cross sections of the chest to know where the supports are going to be and how wide everything is. So everything's on paper before it ever comes out. Nothing left, left and left the chance yeah. because even when you do everything on paper and figure something where it's all going to go and how it's going to all go, how it's going to all work, there's always something you overlook mm -hmm. and usually uh, you can overcome that because so much, so many other things are already fixed.
we're now in the engineering room, which is a nice little room, which a whole lot of creative juices come out of it, and we're uh, able to have uh, Mark Henrero here, who will show us the process it goes into with engineering and laying out our instruments, and we're going to show the process of going into preparing a tool board for our CNC router. Uh, well, this is the software that I use to create the part files to machine things on the CNC router. Uh, and what, what it's set up for now is a, a sample tool board based on a job we're currently working on. And it comes out of our CAD software. And this machines both the tool board and the rack board that holds the pipes? Yeah, basically. The, the, the center of the pipe mm -hmm. decides where all that stuff goes. Okay. And then once I get... Uh, a chart with numbers for the rack board mm -hmm. that so you can program that. So if this were going into an organ, your layout of those holes is based on the size of the pipes and the scaling to, to make sure they all fit in that space? Yeah, yeah, depending on what type of chest it is uh, and, and how big the pipe is. There, it's the, the pipe sometimes drives the spacing and then in other cases you've probably seen the valves and things underneath in some cases. You know, as you get into smaller pipes, the the valve underneath becomes the larger object, and so the spacing, at some point it changes from the pipes driving it to the things underneath the tow board driving the spacing. Does the software help you with that in, in finding what your minimum distances is and your maximum? Yeah, to, uh, uh, when you're dealing with the, the valve underneath driving things, it, it's a, it can be a fairly simple grid, because they can only be so close to each other, so everything can get spaced up until that becomes too close for the pipes up top. Then you have to go from that. You switch gears and go up top the tow board and start spacing things from there. But once I have all those centers, the, the CAD software, I draw all the circles in the CAD software. Some of those circles get exported out of that software, imported into this software, mm -hmm. and it, it it has ways of automatically. Uh, processing. So the CNC software, stuff. it actually uses your organ designs to, you can. Yeah, it, it's the it's the transition from CAD software to CAM software. Sure. So then when I'm done in here, I go out there and get the machine set up, get the piece in the machine, and then access the part files and run the part files, which some part files will only contain one toolpath, some part files will have multiple toolpaths contained in one file. It, we're limited. The, the machine is fairly basic. It doesn't have an automatic tool changer or things like that. So I can only, I can only run stuff that's using that one cutter at one time. But I can have multiple tool paths in that one file that are using that. As long as you're using the same cutter, okay. It can, and it'll run several things at once in, in its own order. This software does all that for you and creates literally in some cases tens of thousands of lines of code to make one little piece and it all comes out at the other end and I just say go and, and then turn you can the machine on. You can make the same piece over and over again without having to if you Yeah, to. once it's in the can and right. there's also a templating feature that you know for, hmm. for tow boards there's a lot of repetitive you know there's only so many hole sizes that I need to bore and you know the for where the pipes go the tops have to be chamfered. There's only so many depths of chamfer and that's all driven by the size of the tow hole so there's a templating feature in that where I can create templates based on previous jobs plug them directly in tell it to calculate everything and then spit it out because I had already done all this work I just started this about five minutes ago and I'm ready to save out part files and send it over the machine because the templates were already saved I just had to make a couple of quick little changes and have it calculate it and then I can just save it all out and send it out to the machine the shop today you're going to see that we have a project uh, going through the works uh, from uh, St. Francis of Assisi Cathedral in Metuchen, New Jersey. This is a 1983 Shantz that we're in the process of rebuilding and the first thing we see here uh, is Chris Mills, uh, a qualified technician doing uh, uh, pneumatic work. He's replacing several of the primary actions to one of the offset chests. So you'll see a lot of these boards all over the shop right now, and every one of them needs some 
degree of attention and care in the rebuilding process. So this is all electro-pneumatic action. It has lots of little leather valves in it and leather pouches that need to be replaced. So he's replacing every single one, I would assume. That's correct. Um, there is a durability and life expectancy of pneumatic actions. Uh, this organ has given very fine and faithful service in a cathedral setting. And what we're doing is uh, replacing all of the uh, non-durable components, the leather components, the leather action, leather pouches, uh, things like that. All the valves are being addressed as needed, and um, everything is now in the process, of, as you can see, of being reassembled into the uh, pouch board. So where are we now? Uh, we are in the heart and soul of our company, which is the wood shop. Um, very, very important in an organ building company to have a fully stocked wood shop. Uh, when I was an apprentice, I worked with a company that had the latest and greatest modern equipment for woodworking, and then I went to work for a company that was fully outfitted from 1920 and had, was, was poorly lit. I really enjoyed the latest and greatest stuff much, much better. Uh, it was a pleasure to work in. Good light and uh, good equipment makes a big difference in the quality of the work you do. Well, you've got a lot of space and a lot of modern equipment. I can see what just from a layman's point of view, what, what machines do we have in here? We have uh, pretty much everything that a woodworker really needs. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, ample windows, we can see outside. Uh, all our shop is fully LED uh, lit. So we have uh, plenty of light, uh, wide joiner, uh, planer, production sander, uh, saw stop safety, uh, table saw, uh, a CNC router, uh, panel saw, uh, several drill presses, um, and then from there we go into smaller production machinery. I see more and more organ builders bringing CNC routers into their shops. What do you mainly use it for? What do you find it's most useful or what it's best at? The CNC router is something that can do a lot of uh, repetitive operations accurately and relatively efficiently. You need an operator, you need a person who can enter the information into the computer to make the machine work properly. Once that's set to the design, uh, you can create uh, multiples uh, of whatever in a very, very consistent, and consistent is the capital C word here, consistency. So I definitely see uh, poplar and some oak. What all kinds of wood do you usually use when construction of an organ? That's pretty much primarily uh, our first choice. All internal components of an organ, uh, we use uh, poplar, mm -hmm. which is available domestically here in Pennsylvania. And we use uh, a lot of uh, white oak for casework and consoles you know, when we're using stock uh, components. Uh, white oak, usually if it's plain sawn or quarter sawn, we use both. Um, that's a cabinet grade material. It takes stain very nicely and most church furniture is usually of the white oak variety. Uh, the red oak usually has a more wild grain um, but can be useful as well. If a client has a specialized need for any other pieces of wood, we're happy to do that. Um, on the uh, lesser side, we will also use walnut and maple for, uh, maple for pedal boards. Mm. Um, as I say, walnut is very common and cherry. Okay. Uh, beyond that, we get into we can use anything else, but that's primarily our main palette of colors of wood and species to use. And you generally want to match what the church already has when exactly. you're bringing an organ into an existing building. So exactly, either through stain or wood grain, wood type, then you can sure. hopefully get the hopefully make an organ that looks like it always belonged there in the or in the sure, church. Sure, sure, because uh, poplar we can always paint, mm -hmm. and when you have a situation where you need to paint something, uh, we use poplar. It takes paint very easily, and it's a, it's a hardwood. That's the key thing to use, is that organ builders always use hardwoods which have no knots in them, and they take sanding, they take stain or paint in an uh, agreeable manner. You mentioned maple for pedal boards. There's a pedal mm -hmm. board being refurbished over here. Let's go take a look at it. Sure. Uh, here we have uh, a little uh, demonstration explanation for the cathedral in Metuchen, New Jersey, the Schatz organ, which had given many years of faithful service. Um, this, nothing shows greater uh, the years of faithful service than these pedal keys because you can see uh, these holes here indicate the uh, screw holes they used to hold the pedal keys on. The, these pedal keys were worn down right to the screw heads uh, pretty extensively. You can see where they began and over the years of playing and whatever uh, they've been worn down quite, uh, quite impressively actually. And uh, the same thing with the sharps. These are synthetic sharps um, and a hole in them. Not supposed to be there, but that's from years and years and years and years of playing, and very well. So what we've done now is we've taken them all apart, and we have put new uh, maple uh, caps on all of the toe levers, 
uh, after we've repainted the um, levers themselves. And we put new uh, synthetic caps on top of the levers as well, retaining the compression spring and the proper uh, screw head on it. So these are ready for uh, many more years of service. Uh, once they've been recovered, as you see, they're put back in the pedal board behind me, and then we use a pedal weight, which is set to uh, the proper uh, standard for AGO weight, three pounds per AGO. And uh, each key then is weighed, each spring is adjusted, so you have a consistent key weight as you go up and down the pedal board scale. So here we have the, the pedal board. As you can see, we've started the process of installing each pedal key. They're all numbered. They have to go in a specific order. So what basically the technician would do is they put their key weight on it, and it has to depress. If it either depresses too quickly or too uh, slowly, it determines how much of the key spring, which is underneath, you have to adjust. So you know, that one probably passed the muster. Then this is a sharp key, and then it has to go down to a certain degree. and. Um, they have to all be the same and all go down evenly. The same manner and the same uh, distance and the same speed. So we can get a nice, even, consistent adjustment throughout all the pedal board springs. Very, very important. Organists can feel that. Um, but we do all that adjustment here, here in the shop. So over in here we build Winchester, correct? Correct, correct. So what we have before us here is the beginning of the grade of the antiphonal chest at the Cathedral of Metuch in New Jersey. Um, there are some changes being made to the instrument, and specifically in this case, the antiphonal. And uh, it warranted us to simply build a new wind chest. And we're being faithful to the Shantz uh, product. We respect it highly. And so this wind chest is uh, constructed at the same length as the old chest. We're using the same colored stain uh, for the outside of the wind chest. The toe boards went on silver, which was standard for Shantz construction of that day and so it, we want it to look like it's always been there. So talk a little bit about the chest construction. What does it take to make an electronomatic chest? I mean, what do you have to have to support the pipes? Uh, how big can they get? Or how big do they have to be to support all of the mechanics? Well, the, the chests have to be uh, big enough to support the mechanics and to accommodate all the pipes that are designed to go on this chest. Uh, the particular chest right here is built to hold three stops, and uh, we have to have a, a good, solid uh, grid which will, as you can see, be supported from both ends uh, so it can't sag, okay? So it's got to be stout and sturdy in order to uh, hold its own weight of the chest and the pipes on it. Um, uh, in this case, it's a grid. There'll be tow boards that go on top of it. Uh, the, the actions will go onto the tow boards, and on top of the tow boards will be rack boards, of which all the pipe will go uh, into. Uh, this chest will be exposed. So you will see it from the ground. There'll be some sturdying around it, some pretty decoration on it. But the pipes themselves are actually going to be functional, and they're going to be part of the uh, visual enhancement of the cathedral. So the viewer will see them from the floor. So are these the tow boards that will hold the pipes? Uh, these are actually the rack boards. Oh, rack. Okay, these are oh, the rack boards. Thinner, they're, right? they're thinner. The uh, tow boards are going to be about an inch and a half thick, mm -hmm. and we'll see them in the other room. And these are the rack boards, and they still have to have uh, center spotting put on them. Uh, but we uh, commonly use, as you'll see, all of our tow boards, all of our rack boards, we prefer to use um, uh, glued up quarter sawn uh, wood, uh, poplar. Uh, we find that this is much more stable with uh, glue ups than solid lumber. Solid lumber, when you get into the uh, excessive widths and thicknesses required, um, can be a little unstable, especially, bend yes, it can bend a little bit because uh, we, we don't really deal with old growth lumber as much anymore mm -hmm. as we do with new growth lumber. So we try to um, offset that by using uh, um, poplar that is um, run through the table saw and is quarter saw and then it's glued up like a butcher block because butcher blocks are very, very stable. And uh, we make all the butcher block here in our shop and then we find that that is uh, machines very nicely, takes grain stain very nicely, but most importantly, it's consistent and it is stable, doesn't warp and check or whatnot. So you also have to have a bit of gasketing material to make sure that it's airtight. What do you right. use to, to keep that sealed? Right. In this particular uh, project, we're using a synthetic on this, um, on this chest. We use a gasketing material for where the tow board meets the, the grid. We'll also use a gasketing material <coughs> for the lifting up bottom panels to get into the action to do any kind of mechanical adjustment. Um, we commonly use either a synthetic material or leather, and then sometimes we will use, uh, use cork. Um, the leather is our preferred method. Um, in this case, 
Uh, for this chest, we're using something that was uh, pragmatic for uh, uh, the rest of the instrument. All the poplar boards are uh, ripped first, and then they are turned quarter sawn, and then they're glued up. And this is a, an example here of us making uh, a blanks, a glue up blanks for either tow boards, rack boards, any kind of uh, long dimensional lumber. All the boards, as you can see, are, are been ripped, and they're in a specific number. They have to go in in the order that they came off the board. That way the board, when it kind of does its thing, it does its thing in a uniform fashion. So any kind of times you have grains that go opposite direction, that's when you have conflict. We, we like um, harmonious uh, wavelengths in our wood. So that's what's happening here. This board is being glued up. Uh, in this case, a clamp system. We also have a vacuum press uh, table over there that we will use uh, to glue up uh, larger uh, sections of wood, especially when you have to glue up a large piece on top of it. We use a vacuum press uh, for that, and that works out very, very well. So you showed us how you make use of solid wood, but it is true that we use laminated wood in organ building too. A lot of people think that's a, they hear plywood and they think, oh, cheap plywood like I get at Home Depot, but that's not really what we're using. We're talking about furniture grade sort of wood, right? That's correct. Uh, normally you, you come across fr uh, furniture grade, or I should say uh, plywood, which you'll see at Home Depot. Sheathing, OSB, things like that, flake board, that's the run of the mill stuff that you see have knots on it. It just looks awful. Um, but there are those times when you need a, a, a material in the right case, and we use a multi-ply material. The best way to just demonstrate is to look at the kind of uh, multiplies that are available. First you have here is, is, is uh, uh, MSD, <laughs> and um, it is simply, uh, it has its uses here and there, very limited, but it does have its use because it's very inert, very stable. Um, and uh, things like expression boxes, because uh, sound doesn't go through it. Because yeah, this is um, pretty dense. This very is dense a, stuff, heavy... right. So you wouldn't build a wind chest out of it. You wouldn't build any kind of machinery or mechanical function out of it. But when you want to build a house, mm -hmm. uh, you want it to be solid, stable, and uh, inert. Yeah, because you might need a long length of this. And that long, that's a lot of gluing up or a big piece of wood that might uh, bend and warp. Is what, so yeah, you can do something like this. That makes Use sense. That. That's correct. So what else do we might? Well, also, you may want to look at the end grain of plywoods. I mean, here we mm. have a, a, a veneer, mm. a nice oak veneer. And here you'll see um, very wide laminates called a solid core. And um, it is used sometimes for uh, casework when you have fields, wide fields. and uh, the thing that really uh, creates havoc with lots of solid wood casework instruments is central heating. Central heating can dry out the wood and cause a lot of checks and splits. Um, with modern engineered uh, materials like this, uh, it's uh, very uh, stable mm -hmm. and doesn't check. Uh, in this case, if you're going to use uh, casework, whether you have a, want a nice pretty veneer but don't want it to check, you can have that. And I assume if you have something, say it's a nice hardwood, you can only, that way you're only really paying for the veneer, but you get the strength of the interior wood without having right. to have a solid, thick piece of something expensive. That's correct. That's correct. Then the other thing we want to talk about is uh, multigrain. Now, multigrain, again, if you're using, you're using uh, sometimes for very small uh, components where you need to have some structure for which a solid piece of wood just won't, uh, it'd be practical to work with. You can use this very high quality uh, multigrain. You can see that the layers, the veneers, are very, very small. So there's a, quite a bit of, of glue mm -hmm. and um, wood in between. You know, modern adhesives are really much better used in this application. Organ builders use primarily high glue mm -hmm. for all of their machinery and um, mechanical components. But what woodworker uh, a woodworker has come a long way, and so they would use often modern adhesives, which are very, very strong, very, very dense. And in this case, when you have more, when you have more veneers and glue, I mean, this is a solid piece. This is this is as uh, hard as a solid piece of wood. You can machine this. Uh, you can use it for um, uh, uh, structural subassemblies. I would not build a wind chest out of it. I would not use it for uh, any of those critical machinery parts, but any kind of secondary components. Maybe like the console or a stop rail or something like that? Something that is not seen, mm -hmm. but something that has to be rugged, stable, and uh, useful. Uh, this can be considered for that.